Hey, John here from John Stewart Yourself. Hey, I was contacted by a senior master sergeant from Germany and she saw my site and said, hey, would you build me a shadow box? Now, I don't build shadow boxes for a living, but I thought, if you can send me an idea and I think it's unique enough, I'll build it. And so what she had done is she had taken the aircraft that she worked with, an F-15, and she had taken her rank and she had combined the two. And I thought that was pretty cool. And I said, okay, send me what you've got and I'll work with it in Photoshop and see if I can come up with something that I can build. So I played around in Photoshop and this is what I came up with. So I decided, okay, um, I'll go ahead and build this. And I'm sure other people would like this design. It's pretty unique. Um, so remember, I do make mistakes. So I will show you all my mistakes in this video and you can avoid them if you attempt to build this. So let's get cutting. Her only requirement was that she wanted the box to be small, two feet by two feet. So I cut out a paper template that would keep me close. The tip of the wing of the aircraft actually made the box 25 inches wide. I did not want to shorten this or it would change the perspective of the box. I bought an eight foot by six inch piece of mahogany at Home Depot. For those of you who don't know, that actually means eight foot by five and a half inches. In my head, I thought this would be enough wood. I had planned on tackling this project just like I built the Texas Shadow Box, but I came up with something better. Instead of laying all the pieces over the template and then cutting it out, I decided to turn the wood on its side. This would conserve a lot of my material. I still had to double up the wood where the board on its side would not be thick enough, but I would save a considerable amount of wood doing it this way. Okay, so this was the first change. This is what I was going to originally do. Make two layers that cover the template and just glue those two layers together and cut it out. This will work, but I came up with a better way. This is where it dawned on me. While using one of the pieces as a straight edge, I thought, why don't I just use that piece as the edge? I thought, duh, I did that with the top of the Texas shadow box. So change one, conserve wood by turning the straightaways on their sides. Remember, the height needs to be the same as two stacked pieces of wood. How come I can get away with this? Yes, because I make this up as I go along. No fancy measuring here. I cheat by laying one piece in the template, then a line in another in the template above the lower. Then just draw the lines and make the cut. This is much faster and more precise. Parts of the aircraft wing had straights, but I thought that they were too small and I would lose strength trying to connect them. The larger your piece, the stronger. So I went back to the original design for the bottom of the aircraft. For my smaller straightaway pieces, I glued them together, but once dry, I placed brads in them for extra stability. The brads are only needed for the building of the frame because once the faceplate is on, they will have all the support they can handle. For me, the wing was more important than the bottom, so I included all of the lower part of the wing in the double wood. Then I just added a piece on the bottom to finish out the perimeter. I wasn't sure how far to go with the straightaways at the top, but I will quickly run through this so you can see that I took it all the way up to the base of the aircraft nose. Now that my bottom piece was dry, I took it to the bandsaw to cut it out. For now, I will only cut the inside of the perimeter, just to be safe. I'm not sure if I will cut the outside perimeter before I put the faceplate on. I decided to hold off on cutting the inside small angles of the wing until I could use a drill to give me space to turn. For some of the straightaways, that support a lot of the weight of the wing, I decided to use my pocket jig to give it greater support. Unlike the Texas Shadow Box, I will place these pockets directly on top. Once the faceplate is on, they will be completely covered, so there's no worry here. In order to ensure I keep aligned, I raise up the parts and ensure they are staying in the lines of the template. It's easy to adjust if you do it before joining major pieces together. Once you've joined them, they're pretty much set. I continue on with that same process of the pocket jig to build out the rest of the wing. Once I have the wing built out, 
I use the same process to join it to the bottom. Notice that I clamp my pieces to the workbench before I set my screws. Don't think you can hold this still and fasten them together. The torque you place on the board being attached is pretty great. Ensure it doesn't move by using your clamps wisely. For those of you who follow along on Facebook during the making of this project, you will remember that this is where my bandsaw blade was so dull it started cutting crooked. So I went inside and ordered a new one. But being impatient, I came back out and decided to continue on with the jigsaw. Using the same process of pocket holes and glue, I joined my top pieces together. I wanted them to be thick because the wood I was cutting would be at a slight arch. And if the wood was on its side like the straightaway pieces, the arch would cause the pieces to be too thin. I felt my pocket hole screws were so tight that there might be a bow in the two pieces where they joined. So to remedy this, I flipped it over and clamped it down until the glue dried. Taking a second look at the top, I realized that I did not need all the excess wood to make the arch. This would be accentuated by the faceplate, so I used two leftover cuts to create an arch at the top of the second layer. Then I simply glued them down and stuck a few brads in them since this would all be covered by the faceplate. I grabbed some scrap cuts to fill out the rest of the aircraft nose in the same fashion. After drilling out a hole to give my jigsaw some wiggle room, I cut out the rest of the interior of the aircraft wing. Now that my top is dried, I go back to my template and trace out the top directly onto the wood. This will give me my cut lines. Take note of the parts that hang over the bottom layer. They will need to be trimmed away. You can do all the straights and easy ones right there on your miter saw. For the rest, you will need your jigsaw or bandsaw. If you feel uncomfortable cutting the inside of the arch with your miter saw, just switch over to your jigsaw. It's a lot safer. This is the reason we could not use pieces on their sides. This step would have caused the top to be too thin. Cutting the slight arch on these pieces makes them as thin as the rest of the box. The next step would be to join the bottom and the top of the frame together in the same fashion as before, with your pocket jig and glue. Then off to the sanding table. Before we can start on the faceplate, we will need to ensure the top of the frame is really smooth. Now we are going to start to build out the faceplate. I take a quick measurement from side to side to be exact, so I don't waste any more wood. I'm getting down to my last pieces. Starting with the longest piece I have, I rip it in half on the table saw. Now I would have preferred to do this on the band saw because I could have made three pieces out of one board. But my band saw will only cut up to five inches, and these boards are five and a half, and I just can't bring myself to cut that extra half inch off. If you try to cut too much at once, the wood will bend and start to grab at the blade. So to keep this from occurring, I make multiple passes. Then I flip it over and repeat until the board is cut in half. So having repeated this process twice, I now have enough to cover the entire frame. When I made the stripes for the Master Sergeant shadow box, I glued my pieces together and then sanded first with a belt sander and then with an orbital sander. To save myself some time, I will run these pieces through the planer and then sand. Assuming you will not have a planer, you can skip this step and start gluing your pieces together. Before I set these in place to glue, I lay them out to ensure that all of the grain looks good where they will be joined together. I cut my pieces really close to the edges to conserve wood. So I am sure it all fits on the frame once glued together. I will draw out the inside and outside of the perimeter of the frame with a pencil before I glue them together. This will also help me align them while gluing since a few are different sizes. During this next step, I intend to just eyeball it. 
But here I am going to create a 1 8 lip on the inside of the perimeter. I'm just going to make this freehand. Now we are ready to glue your face plate pieces together. Lay a few scraps pieces down and cover them with some paper towels. You don't want the face plate sticking to your scrap pieces. It's easy to sand away paper towel if it sticks. Grab your clamps, have them at the ready, and put down some glue. Squeeze your pieces tight and clamp into position. I joined the top two and the bottom two. You can join all four together if you intend to use a jigsaw, but because I intend to use my bandsaw, I will hold off joining the two pieces together. I take a drill and drill out the corners of the tight areas in the wing. This will allow me some pivot space for my bandsaw blade. Then just cut out the rest of your face plate. If you are using a jigsaw, you will need these pivot holes also, so don't skip this step. Now we are going to start working on the display board. Take your frame and place it over your foam board. Mine was a little bit short, so I plan on leaving a gap at the top. No one will ever see it under the face plate, and this saves me from having to add an extra piece. Grab a pencil and trace out the inside of the frame onto the foam board. If you are a subscriber, you know that I am cheap. I buy the quarter inch boards at Everything's a Dollar and glue two of them together to give me the half inch thick foam that if you buy it separately is much more expensive. So you can probably skip this step of gluing two pieces together unless of course you are cheap like me. While my display board is drying, I quickly cut out the top of the face plate. To cover the extended portion of the nose of the aircraft, I add one more piece to ensure total coverage. While the glue is drying, I set up my router in order to create a lip for the back plate. My router bit is a quarter inch wide with a depth of a quarter of an inch. Okay, learning from past mistakes, I remember to trace out the back plate with the frame before I cut it. If you route before this step, you can still flip the frame over and use the top side. Just make sure you reverse your back plate to the rough side so the smooth side is outward. And since this is so confusing to me, I just remember this time not to make the mistake. You need to add the quarter inch to the perimeter of your line. This will ensure your back plate sits on your routed lip. I used a ruler and made a quarter inch mark all the way around the perimeter and then simply used the ruler to connect them with straight lines. I want the back plate to sit flush with the frame, so I use it as a gauge to set the depth of the router bit. Then route your frame. Very important here. Remember to keep spinning your piece. This will ensure you keep the wood going in the proper feed direction. It is easy when going around the perimeter of an object to end up going in the wrong direction. The router bit will not like this and this could cause disastrous chipping and you don't want to have to start your frame over again. So now that the perimeter is done, we can cut out your back plate. Check your fit and make adjustments where necessary. Going back to the router, I am going to place a slight lip on the top of the box. This will allow more support than just the lip of the face plate. So using a scrap piece of plexiglass, I set my depth. Now the top of your frame should have a quarter inch groove all the way around it. Now that your display board is dry, cut out your silhouette. Start by cutting the right side out. You will use it to trace in the left side. This will ensure both sides are perfectly symmetrical. Now cut the aircraft away from the rank. To ensure that I have enough buffer once the fell is on, I trim away a blade width of the wing to ensure a tight fit. So laying your display pieces down, there should be a little play between the two pieces. Ensure that there are no tight areas. Okay, here is a cutting mistake. After inspecting my work, I see that I have two gaps that are just too wide. So I will show you how I correct these mistakes so we can move on. All I'm going to do is shave off some foam board from scrap pieces and tape it into the gap. This will ensure once covered by the felt, the felt will be touching the frame. I will do this for both gaps. The next step is the same for all my videos. Cut two pieces of felt that will fully cover your display boards and then apply the glue and glue down your felt. 
I use Elmer school glue, so nothing fancy here. As you can see, to distinguish between the aircraft and the rank, I will use two separate colors, black and dark navy blue. Take your display boards and flip them over. Trim away the excess felt, leaving about one inch all the way around your silhouette. Now, on the bends, make small outward cuts. Start your cuts about two-eighths of an inch away from the foam board. Now, pull your felt over the back and tape down. Here I use colored duct tape that matches the color of the felt. Repeat this process all the way around the aircraft and to both silhouettes. Now, with the felt on both silhouettes, the gap between the aircraft and the rank should be tight again. Okay, this is where I discover my first huge mistake. The nose of the aircraft is centered as if the frame outline of the aircraft continues all the way around the aircraft. Here is a quick Photoshop of what I pictured in my head and why I aligned it this way. So at first glance, I don't think people will get that the nose aligns to the frame. That isn't really there. So I have to adjust the nose so it is aligned to the interior black felt and not the frame. So, oh crap. Need time to think about this one. So while I'm thinking about that, let's move on. Now we are going to attach your display board to the back plate. I just throw down a spider web of wood glue, place the display board on the back plate, and then put the frame on the back plate and then weigh down the display board until it is dry. This will ensure your display board is properly fitted within the frame. After some thought, I decided to just move the nose of the aircraft over. It is wood after all, and I am a woodworker, right? I guess this mistake was not that huge, so let's fix this optical illusion. I drew out a cut line and then took it to the bandsaw. And of course, being the knucklehead that I am, I forgot that my blade has not arrived yet, so this venture has to go to the jigsaw. Because I want to cut the new nose and have it smooth with the faceplate, I intend to attach the faceplate first. So I need to join the two parts of the faceplate together and get them ready to attach to the frame. After they dry, I will sand and prep the faceplate for staining. With an orbital sander, I smooth the faceplate, and with a detail sander, I round all the inside edges. Going back to my nose, I used the old one to trace out a new one. I grabbed some of the scrap wood that was cut from the bottom of the frame. I also made this a little more narrow this time. So in the end, I think it actually looks better than the fatter nose. If you're wondering why I waited to cut out the nose, it's because I wanted to do it on the bandsaw for a more precise cut when I'm doing the arch. And so I waited until my new blades arrived. Now to align the nose. I place a few scrap pieces under the box so I can slide the new nose under and visually align it to the felt. And then I draw out the contour of the box. With a precise line, I take it back to the bandsaw and cut it. No worries here if you're not perfect. Remember, this will all be covered by the faceplate. To ensure it stays centered when attaching it, I draw a centering mark on the frame by measuring the width of the felt. Then I place a centering mark on the nose. After doing this, I take out my pocket jig and drill my holes so I can attach with both screws and glue. You can place your pocket holes right on top as they will be covered by the faceplate. If you are a subscriber, you know how terrible I am with glass. You know that I would never even dream of attempting to do this in glass. So, I take out my piece of plexiglass and lay it over the frame. With a sharpie, I simply draw the lines directly above the routed groove. I make my cut on the outside of the line when cutting. I would rather have it too large and not fit than too small and have a gap appear. If it's too large, we can always pull it back to the bandsaw and make corrections. Here is a step that you should not skip. Take a scrap piece of wood and run it around the frame and make sure that the plexiglass is below the top of the frame all the way around it. This will cause serious issues when you go to attach your faceplate and you can't make a good bond between the faceplate and the frame because the plexiglass is too high. So ensure it is all below here. 
Okay, another change. My plexiglass fit was so good, I decided to do away with the small quarter inch lip that I had created on the faceplate. So I clamped down the frame to the faceplate, and with a ruler to keep me from falling into the routed frame area, I draw out new lines that will do away with any lip on the faceplate. Now here you have to use a jigsaw because your faceplate is all joined together. Take your time and cut your new line which will cut off your old lip. Grab your detail sander and repeat the sanding of the inside of the faceplate. Do not round the underside that will be touching the plexiglass. For this box I will be using Bombay Mahogany. Like all my projects, I will simply rub this on with paper towels. I didn't cover the entire faceplate because I knew I would be cutting most of it away, but make sure you get all the way around the lip and a little on the back side or the underside of the lip. While the stain is drying, I sand the inside and the back of the frame. Don't waste time on the sides. We will sand again once the faceplate is on and cut. Now is the best time to get those hard to reach areas. They have to be done before the faceplate is put on. Ensure your frame is wiped down and dust free. Then continue staining. Just the inside of the frame and the plexiglass lip. We will stain the sides once we have the faceplate joined. After your stain dries, we can put on your faceplate. Place your plexiglass in position. Remember that we have not removed the protective covering from the plexiglass. Place a bead of glue all the way around the frame of the box, and then flip your frame over and lay directly on the faceplate. Take a small straight edge and ensure your sides are flush. The outside alignment is more important than the inside lip. Clamp your faceplate down and you are done for the day. You don't want to rush the drying of the faceplate to the frame, so just come back tomorrow. The following day, I came out and I removed all of my clamps. Looks good, so uh, time to trim away the outer edge. I put a trim bit on my router and before the real deal, I run through with a test piece. The most important aspect here is the speed of your bit. I would recommend a slower speed to keep the wood from chipping if your grain is not aligned. I trim away all but about a quarter of an inch so there is less work for my trim bit to do. So a quick run through the bandsaw before I hit it with the router. Trim out your frame and remember to go in the proper feed direction of the bit. Grab your jigsaw and cut out the jets on the bottom of the aircraft. For those really hard to reach and tight corners, Drill a hole in each of the corners, then take a coping saw and cut the rest away. Now you can go back and sand the sides of the box. Don't be afraid to sand the top over again if it needs it. Just stay away from the plexiglass. Now it's time to cut out the stripes. I grabbed an old piece of pine from the shed. Seriously, this thing was a window valence from the 1970s. I cut a small piece off and aligned a rectangle on the board and then I marked its center. Then I took the paper template and cut out the top stripe from it. I used it to mark out the stripe onto the wood. I flipped it over in order to get the extended end on both sides. I will cut the ends of the stripes once I can see how they align to the faceplate. Once you have your single stripe cut out, you can flip it up on its side and cut it into three parts. Yes, I know I only need two, but I want them thin and it doesn't hurt to have an extra in case you screw one up. Take your stripe back to the faceplate and make your marks visually while looking at the aircraft and then take it back to the bandsaw to cut. Repeat this process for the next piece also. Then a quick trip to the miter saw will make your cut straight. Before we paint these, they go to the sanding board. With a fine 220 grit paper, I hit it with the orbital sander. Then I take out my detail sander and round the top edges only. Do not sand or round the bottom side of the stripes. Now we can go back and stain the sides of the frame. The same color as before and the same process, stain the sides and if you took the time to sand any of the faceplate earlier again, go ahead and stain that as well. 
So I was not too sure what color to make the stripes, and I didn't want to limit myself to the preferred blue. I'm kind of biased. So I took the time to cut in half the extra stripe and paint one in blue and the other I stained it. Then I thought, what about white? And I did one in white also. You can skip this exploratory process since I have done it for you and go with the blue. It looks fabulous. I almost considered using the bare pine unstained and unpainted, but the blue won out and in the end that's what I went with. After the stripes dry, all you need to do is glue them down. Take your time and make sure you achieve your proper alignment that you use to cut the edges. Then clamp them down and allow them to dry. Now we are nearing the end. Here I used some spray shellac. I used this on the Marine Corps shadow box and it was much easier than the brush on polyurethane that I used previously. And the results with this stuff are fantastic. So just in case, I put another layer down over the plexiglass to protect the cover and coat the box with a nice healthy coat. When that is dry, I put on my hanging brackets using the 16 inch separation standard. This is so the nails can be set into the studs. I will use simple picture brackets to hold the back plate into position, but this step is not shown. The last step is to pull off the plexiglass protection. Find a small corner and with an X-Acto knife, pry up enough of the plastic until you can get a good grip on it. If it's still small, I usually use a pair of needle nose pliers to get a good grip, but then pull it free. Once you're done, flip the box over and clear off your paper towel protection and then repeat this process. Put your box back together and you're done. Now all that awaits is the contents of the box and the retirement ceremony. So that's how we took Giselle's concept and made it into reality. Good luck Giselle in your retirement and thanks for letting me build your shadow box. Thanks for watching everyone and hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up if you like Giselle's design.